How's everyone doing out there? Yeah? Awesome. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be here in front of you all to speak this morning. My name is Fred Mendog. If you don't know who I am, I'm one of the elders here, and I'm also one of the co-leads of Life Group Central. I meet here on Wednesday nights, and I am so excited to see you all. And as you all may have noticed, I am not Josh, because my name's Fred, so that's a little bit different there. But Josh is on vacation. He's with his family right now. So just be praying for him as they travel and as they just come together and just try to bond with each other and just enjoy their time together. So as you all may know, we're in 1 Corinthians 8, so you can go ahead and get turned to that as we kind of get situated here. As you saw in the video, we have the community cleanup coming up here very soon. This is going to be an awesome event where we get to go out into the community, get to share with them, just get to love on them a little bit. We're going to be going to some houses out there, uh, working on some landscaping work. We're going to come out here. We're going to clean up the river area, and we're going to go on the highway and clean up a little bit out there just to give back to the community, which we're part of. We're also going to be doing some work here as we kind of prepare for Easter and that service and just preparing for everything that is entailed with that. So if you guys are interested in that, we got more information out at the ministry desk, and that's going to be happening on April 9th. So I'm going to be excited to see you all out there and just getting everything ready and just to give back a little bit to our community in which, we, in which we live. So we have been in 1 Corinthians. We have been in 1 Corinthians is where we've started. So this city of Corinth is a city that is just habitually known for doing bad things. So think of Las Vegas, but on a whole other level, okay? So this is way beyond a Las Vegas style. So they've, they've taken it to the extreme. They know how to party for real, right? So these people party. There's a bunch of sailors there because it's a port. So if you know what sailors do, yeah, just think about that. Not too much, though. Pray. Yeah, don't think too much about that. That's bad. <clears throat> but you have these Corinthians there. They're trying to learn what it looks like to walk with Christ and to follow God in the midst of all this immorality that's going on. So Paul wrote them a letter, and he's kind of working through some of their divisiveness as a church, through some of their immorality that they've led in that's creeped in into the church because of the situation and where they lived. And he's also kind of turned and answered to some of their questions that they've had. So in chapter 7, we started digging into some of those questions, like what does it look like to live here in the area where Aphrodite, Aphrodite her temple is the one, and how do we mend relationships? Like, what does marriage look like in the midst of this? What does being single look like in the midst of this? What does being divorced look like? So they had a lot of questions and what it pertained with with their faith. And so now here Paul turns his attention to another question that they had, and that is, is it okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols in the temple? Is that all right? Can we do that? Because everything is centered around these idols. Everything we do, every, how we live and breathe and engage with this world around us is all centered around these idols. So is it okay to partake in this in any way, shape, or form? Or is it something we should abstain from? So Paul gives them two answers here, and he advocates for two kinds of freedom. One where we have absolute freedom in Christ, where because of him we have absolute freedom and authority to go out and enjoy the world. But there's also this other freedom that restricts itself, a freedom that restricts its own freedom for the sake of others, giving up some of our rights to make sure others are better off because of it. So true freedom here comes at the grace of giving up your freedom. So this kind of helps us in the Christian walk, especially here in the 21st century where we're kind of engaged in gray areas. So if you guys didn't know, there's a lot of things happening now in the world that the Bible really doesn't talk about. Right? So how do we navigate that? What does that look like? How do we kind of see what God's will is in certain things? And are we following him? Are we giving him the glory the way we ought to? Or are we kind of following our own leading and doing what we want? So this chapter kind of pushes into some of that and gives us some insight of what that looks like to kind of filter through these gray areas. So that's what we're going to look at and just the convictions that God is putting in our heart and how we should handle those in relationship with our relationships here in the church. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into Scripture and see what God has in store for us this morning. God, thank you for who you are, Lord. Lord, we praise you. We worship you, Lord. And whatever presuppositions we had before we walked in these doors, Lord, I pray that you would just destroy those, and you would just speak to our heart what you want to speak to our hearts, Lord. Lord, I know some of this may be challenging to us, may be convicting to us. So Lord, I pray that you challenge us and you convict us, Lord, and you tear away anything that is standing in the way of us and you and our relationship with you, Lord, so you get all the glory. Because, Lord, you alone are worthy of all our worship, all our praise, and all our honor and glory, Lord. So we want to give that to you, and we don't want it to be hindered by anything standing in that way. 
And Lord, we pray for all the other churches, Lord, who proclaim your name and follow your words, Lord. We pray for them. We pray blessing upon them, Lord, in the demographic in which they reach. We pray that you would just use them mightily for your kingdom, especially in this area, Lord, that they would just do, um, be your hands and feet for you, Lord. And we also pray for Pastor Josh and his family, Lord, as they are enjoying just time together. And Lord, we pray that you just allow that to be a blessed time. Um, we ask that you would just provide them safe travels as well, Lord, and that your will would just be done with all that, Lord. We can't wait to see what you have for us this morning. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name. All right, so we are going to be starting in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 3. So now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge, and this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So here we have Paul. He's kind of setting the premise for us. He's letting us know that love should be our foundation for everything, especially knowledge. And what the world wants to do with us, the world wants to take knowledge and make knowledge its own thing and wants to do it void and separate of God. And here Paul is coming in. He's making sure that we keep the foundation, which is Christ through love. This is our foundation that we have for all our knowledge. So many in the Corinthian church at this time were part of religious sacrifices because worship and idols at this day and age went hand in hand. So for us, we may not understand that because if we want some meat, we just go down to Piggly Wiggly. We get our meat, we get it back, right? And there's no idols involved. We didn't worship to a Hindu god or anything. We just got our meat, right? And if you want to go eat, we just go down to DJ's and get some food. You can get your meal there without any repercussions of worshiping another god. But for the Corinthians at this time, temples were everywhere. They had the temple to Aphrodite, they had to Poseidon, they had Apollos, they had temples for literally everything. And if you were going to partake in festivities or partake with other people in the area, it happened at the temple. So if you went out to eat, you were going to the temple, right? If you went to somebody's birthday party, it happened at the temple. If you were going to buy some food to eat, some meat, it happened at the temple. So all these things were centered around that. It was a part of just how they lived. So the Corinthians were trying to figure out what that looked like. Like, how do we navigate this? Like, are we really worshiping idols if we get some meat from there? Or can we partake in that? Or what, what's, what's going on here? So some of them, knowing what was going on at these temples, it would have been very difficult for them to accept eating that meat. Because they see all these things, and they had all these presuppositions of what was happening because of what they saw going on at the temple. And for them to separate the two would have been very, very difficult. <clears throat> so Paul introduces this idea that we all have knowledge. This may have been more the Corinthians speaking to him, saying, hey, we all have certain knowledge in Christ. And he was using that. He said, hey, we all have knowledge. And anyone who knows the claims or teachings of Christ can claim some sort of knowledge in him. And, but the thing is, we can use that knowledge to puff ourselves up. So you can claim a certain knowledge, like knowledge at this time was Gnostics was gnosis, right? That was the Greek word for it, so gnosis. So if you are familiar with church history or just what happened within the church, there was a sect called the Gnostics, right? The, I practiced Gnosticism, and it was about having the certain amount of knowledge that brought you closer to God. And so this is the similar thing that's going on here. Certain people had certain knowledge, and they knew that meat was just meat, and there was nothing really inherent wrong with it, and they had this knowledge. But they allowed this knowledge to puff them up and build them up and make them feel more superior to those under them. We can still do this in the church today. So some of us are like, hey, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I know the ropes. You've only been in this thing for about a week. Just wait a little bit of time because it's going to get bumpy and then you'll know, right? But in God's kingdom, his kingdom, the one who's a week old and the one who's 20 years old, both have the same value in his system. He paid the same price for both of those equally. One doesn't hold greater value than the other. And this is what they're getting to. So the true knowledge of Christ has this different quality about it. It's not about making myself feel better. It's not making me uh, go up here showing my superior knowledge to your knowledge that I'm theologically more wise than you and you couldn't possibly understand what I'm speaking on because you're not at that level, right? This knowledge founded in love is the one that helps generate and build up and creates more love and unity within the church. So you may be asking, so is knowledge bad? Should we stay away from knowledge? What is the deal? Here's the thing. Knowledge is a neutral thing. It is neutral. It can be both bad and it could be both good. It's just how we use it and how we go about it. 
So if you look at physiology, physiology is the study of the body, right? Physiology in the world wants you to separate God from everything. God cannot be a part of physiology if you're intellectually smart, right? They separate it and they say at the very beginning there were some of these chemicals that met in this pool somewhere. And because these chemicals liked each other, it formed somehow this one cell. And then out of that cell, here you are all today. That's what the world wants you to know, right? It was all devoid of God. He had no part in it. If you believe in that, you're just like the people here in the Greek times, like believing in Zeus and Apollos, and that's really stupid. And you have no moral authority to tell me what to do because you are knowledgeably inferior to me my superior ways of thinking. But when we look at knowledge, if you look at it, when I see knowledge and when I look at like physiology and I see all these cells and I see something goes on over here, affects all these other things over here, and we don't even understand, even on a micro level, like we have no idea really what happens within the body. We act like we know, but the, the people, we, we don't know at all, right? We have no clue what goes on in the body. We know so little about it. But when something happens over here, and then it causes all these other things to happen, there's this cascade, and this is so intricate and delicate balance of how things work. That drives me to look at God, right? I can't think about anything like, man, there had to have been something beautiful behind this who created this and put it and gave it life because there is no way in its complexities that this could have just happened on its own. So for me, knowledge drives me closer to God, but for some people, it drives them away from God because it's been void of God. And so now they find their being within that knowledge. But knowledge isn't all bad, right? It's done many things for society. It's helped us. It's benefited us. It's done a lot of good things. It's decreased mortality rates in babies. So back in the day, before the 1920th century, if you had a baby, chances are it was going to die, one in four, right? So between you, your neighbor, and two others, one of those was going to die. It's pretty sad. But today, it's now at 2.9% thanks to the advances in medical technology that we have. And the same thing goes for making it to the age of 16. Chances of you making it to the age of 16 was about half. Between you and your friend, only one of you were going to survive before the 1920th century. But because of advances in science and medicine, that is now down to 4.6. Not only that, we are extreme poverty is at one of its lowest points in all of history. It may not seem like it sometimes when you look at things, but it actually is. We've helped actually through knowledge be able to spread more food around. Not to mention technology in and of itself has given us access to more information than ever possible at any point in time in history. We also have access to more people than we've ever had at any point in history. You can now communicate to somebody all the way across the world that you don't know and actually have meaningful conversation and relationships with because of that. So is knowledge bad? No. Knowledge is not bad, but what we base the knowledge on dictates if it is bad or not. If it pulls us away from God, yes, it is bad. If it drives us towards God and it brings us closer to him and it's founded in that love, then yes, it is good. So all these things, they can have, or they mean nothing in the ends to themselves, right? So knowledge in and of itself means nothing. It's neutral. But knowledge can make us prideful. It can make us prideful. It can build us up and it can set us at a level to where we start to look down upon others. And that is a bad. And when we do that within the church, when we start thinking we're better than somebody else within the church, that starts to create division. It starts to create animosity and it starts to break up the body in which Christ paid for. And that is not good because we damage the body of Christ, which is the very thing that he went to the cross to keep from happening. So to help diffuse any attempt for anyone to have pride or superiority, Paul reminded the Corinthians that knowledge here and now is only partial. That God himself only alone has the full measure of all knowledge. And if we have a relationship with him, we'll get to understand partially at this moment. So it's like having spectacles on, some glasses on, right? And they're all scratched up. They're not the right prescription. They're really bad. And... There's mud on them, and you can't really see. But when God comes, those are going to be lifted off, and we're going to be able to see everything in full. Because God sees the physical. He sees the spiritual. He sees how they're all working together. Somebody said that the the physical world and the spiritual world are so close and tangible with each other, you can reach out and actually touch it. And that when you die, it's just like stepping 
across. You just step over to the new field. We think of it as like a really far away area, but it's very near and very close. And God sees how it's all working together. He sees the spiritual forces behind everything. He sees the physical forces behind everything. But we only get to see in part because we only get to see the physical activities that are going on until one day we will be perfected in that and we will get to see. And through that comes wisdom. Through that comes wisdom because we realize we really know nothing of what God knows. It's like a baby. When a baby's born, right, and it's like two, two minutes old. We'll go two minutes, two seconds, whatever. It just came out. It's really nasty still. It's crying. The dad's over on the floor passed out somewhere, right? And the nurses are waking him up, trying to take care of the baby too. That may have happened to me. It's fine though. <clears throat> so you have this going on. We have more in relationship with this baby and our knowledge than we will ever have with God. Like we are much closer to that baby in knowledge than we will ever be to God. Right? That's how finite our wisdom and knowledge is. It's crazy. So it's only through love, this platform of love, that knowledge finds its most desirable outcome. If we don't have love, then we just have knowledge. If we just have knowledge, that is the void of God. And that's what brings separation. So when we're growing in true knowledge control, but we're no longer concerned by how much we can learn about God just by through pages and like seeing all the rules and regulations, but like, all right, I know I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. So I put all these boundaries in my life to keep me from doing that because I know I shouldn't because I see it written on paper here. But instead, we get to be known by God. And instead of me trying to keep these rules, regulations, I now expose my heart to his, he starts pouring his heart into my heart. And because of that, I'm transformed. And because of that, I follow these things. It's not me trying to do it. It's him doing it through me. Because guys, there's nothing you can do in and of yourself outside of God that's going to please him. Everything we do is filth. Even your best attempts at doing the right thing is still rags. God is the only one who can bring the purity and the cleanliness that is needed. And this should lead us into humility because we understand that we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own without the help of God with us, without him pouring his heart into my heart. So the point Paul is wanting us to see is that showing off your knowledge and putting it on display will achieve nothing at all to build up the Christians around you. It's going to do nothing to build up the church around you. So here's a few questions you can ask yourself. Like, through my knowledge, are people being brought closer to Christ? Are people actually getting to see the face of Christ through my knowledge because it's founded in love? Or is it because I have knowledge and I'm trying to make myself look better that I'm trying to put myself on a pedestal that people are actually being broken down and being driven farther away from Christ when they should be brought closer? And are my fellow Christians being strengthened in their faith? Are they strengthened in what they believe? Are they being built up? Am I doing everything in my power to help them live a life that is worthy? Am I doing everything I can to help them turn their hearts to God so God can transform them on the inside? That brings us into verses 4 through 6. Therefore, as to eating food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. And that there is no God but one, for although there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, one Lord, Jesus Christ, from whom all things are and through whom we exist. <clears throat> all right, Paul begins here by addressing the original question. He clarifies what it is and isn't in relationship to God, pagans, or these idols. He wants to clarify. He's starting to bring clarity to this. And he's saying that in and of themselves, they're just nothing but mere wood and stone. They really have no value outside of that over the God who created everything. And everything that they think these gods can do for them, such as Poseidon, right? He was the god of the sea, and he was also the god of earthquakes. Two things Corinthians would have been suffering with storms from the sea and earthquakes that happened on land. So if they pleased this God in the right way, he would keep them protected. But he's telling them that he has 
nothing over the one true God who is actually true over both the sea and the land. And there's a freedom in knowing where true authority comes from. There's a freedom that comes from that, that knowing God has all true authority and that the price he paid, no one else can take away. There's nothing that you can do to separate my, me from the love of God, and there's nothing I can do to separate you from the love of God at all. There's nothing that can happen. There's no barrier that can be bridged there that will separate you guys whatsoever because God has true authority and true power outside what we can bring to the table. So this does not mean that there's no inherent risk to the idols. He wants them to be clear of this, that there were demonic forces at work behind these idols. That if they opened up the door and they went and they worshiped to these pagan gods and started to give them a higher platform than who God was, that they were letting the influence of demonic spirits come in to their lives. Because this is what the world tries to do, right? They try to separate you from God and they want to put everything in front of you that's not God and want you to worship those things outside of God because they want to push God farther and farther and farther away. And when that happens, we allow demonic influence to be a part of our lives. And as Paul mentioned in chapter 10, he says, you should have no association with this. You shouldn't be a part of this whatsoever because you will allow this demonic influence to happen within your life. And you should not let that happen. And this may have been an issue for the Corinthians, right? But you're saying, how does this really affect me? What does this mean for me? Because we don't really have to worry about idols. We're not having to worry about going down to the temple and getting meat, and we're not worried about it being sacrificed. Guys, there are many things in our lives that we make idols. Our hearts are literally idol-making machines. The world is telling you to put God out there because he doesn't exist and you need to fill your life up with something that's meaningful and experiential and you need to do that to make yourself feel like you have worth. And anytime that happens, we now put something above the standard that God has for us and we put something else on. And when we do that, we allow other demonic influences into our life. And we're allowing those things to have more authority over our lives than what we've allowed God to have. And this is what the world wants for us. So what are our idols? You may have heard Josh speak about this. What do you invest your time in? Where are you giving up your time? Where's your money going? Where do you spend your money on? If you looked at your bank account, I'm sure you could figure out where your heart may be led towards some idols. Is money an idol? Do you think that maybe if you get up to that next tax bracket or if you have this house, a little bit bigger house, you get to that point, or hey, if I am able to provide for my family in this way, or I have this social standing with these other people that somehow I'm going to be fulfilled, and because of that, I'm going to find my value and my worth. Or do we find it through sexuality and romance? If we just find that person who's going to fill this void in my heart, if we just find that one person who doesn't exist, by the way, right? All my married people, you can say amen to that, right? <laughs> There's no one perfect person who's going to fill that void in your heart, right? Because they don't exist. They're a fallen person too. And the only thing that they're going to do is let you down because you've held them up to a certain expectation. And when that happens, you're like, well, I must not have found Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. So I, must, I should probably get a divorce because they're out there somewhere and I need to find them. Alert, there's no one out there that's going to fill that void outside of God. You're not going to find it. Do we allow chemicals? Do we allow chemicals in our bodies to help us forget about things we want to forget about or take us to a place that we want to go because we don't want to deal with what life has for us right here, so we want to go to someplace else? We'd rather let that speak more into our lives than what God speaks into our lives. I know, I've been there. I've been addicted to all the junk. It's hard. Because you know there's something better out there, but you're trying to fill it up with everything you can put in your nose, in your mouth, whatever, shooting it up. You think it's out there somewhere, but you find it's empty, null, and void. And the only thing that can really, truly fill that craving in your heart is God. What about family? Is it your kids? This is probably getting a little more Christian now, right? I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure my kids have a life that I didn't have because I want to provide for them. And every single decision I make is going to be based on my kids, not God. 
to make sure they have the privileges I never got to experience as a child. What about politics? Maybe if we vote for that one person, he's going to save us and he's going to protect us and he's going to be the one who helps this country and helps me live a better life. Right? What do we allow to speak louder in our lives than God? Because that is an idol. But all these things, just as in the time of the Corinthians, all these things have no power over us except for what we allow them to have within our lives. Because all these things are neutral. They're neutral. Money's not bad. Money is an object. It's a neutral thing. A job is not bad. You should have a job. If you don't work, you shouldn't need. That's what the Bible says. Right? A family is not bad. Your God looks proudly upon families. Right? And marriages. He likes all those things. Those things are all acceptable because they are all neutral. And an idol is nothing unless it becomes an object of your worship, just as in the Corinthians. Once it became the purpose of their worship and it took God's place, then it became an issue for these Corinthians. And this is what Paul was wanting them to see. So anytime we publicly advertise our allegiance and testify of the power and worth of something, we begin to worship that thing. So what do we testify to? Do we testify to our job, our social standing? Are we testifying to the money we have, this thing over here that we got? Are we testifying to God and his glory and everything he's done in our lives that we couldn't do, and he's brought us to the situation in which we're in now? Or do we like to take all the glory for it? Because what is this the biggest idol we have, especially in America? It's this idea of self, right? You are literally your biggest idol. And at some point, you all, we have all been guilty of this. And there's not one single person who has not elevated something above God and made God take the back seat. And most of the things that I mentioned before, they have a place in our lives, right? There's a place for your job. There's a place for money. There's a place for your family. All those things are important, and we should have them to some degree. But God, he is the one alone who is worthy of all our worship. He is the one and alone who's worthy of our praise, honor, and glory. And if we try to give it to anything else, we are taking away what is rightfully God's and what he paid a price on the cross for him to have. And that brings us into the last portion of what we'll have today. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food is really offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God, and we are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother from whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, and you sin, therefore, against Christ. Therefore, if you make... If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So here we have Paul. He's now beginning to appeal to the weak conscience. So for these Corinthians who couldn't separate this idea of pagan worship with eating the meat, they couldn't separate this idea because it brought all these things back to their mind. Even though there was nothing really inherently wrong with the meat, which some understood, but these other people, they couldn't get past this idea that they were participating in some way in idol worship. And because of that, it would force them to start giving their allegiance back to that idol instead of giving it to God the way it should and was intended to be. So though it is the weak conscience that has the problem, Paul does not try to fix that conviction. Paul isn't trying to fix the weak person, right? He's, he doesn't want to fix that at all. He wants to go after the person who claims to have knowledge. And he calls them to action by reminding them that their rights and freedoms do not make them a Christian in any better light than the other person. 
Just because they hold on to certain knowledge and they understand God in a certain way does not bring them to a better standing in God's eyes whatsoever. And because of that, they could actually be a stumbling block for their brother or sister in Christ, their friend in Christ, and cause them to sin. So some of us can be destroyed by things before our conscience is ready. Some of us can be destroyed by certain things before our conscience is ready. And part of that is because we have too many associations with that object or action, and it can cause us to relive our past. So there was this point in time where I tore my MCL. I was out on a raft being pulled by a boat, and I was by my brother-in-law who was sitting behind me, and we were getting pulled. We were sitting on this thing, right? <clears throat> we were getting pulled. The guy in the boat was his brother. And like any honorable brother would do, right, he tried to knock him off that raft with all his might and power. And luckily enough, I was sitting right beside him. So I was a part of this whole adventure, being whipped around this lake ad nauseum. And he took us over some rough parts, and I'm flying, holding on with all my might to stay on this raft with every being of fiber in my body. And my leg shoots off the side, snaps my leg back, flips me into the water. I'm in so much pain. Thank God I had a life jacket on because I would have totally drowned. There was no way I could have tried to water. I'm in pain. My knee hurts so bad. And they come back around with the boat. And then I realize I still have to climb up this ladder to get in the boat so I can go home and get off the lake because I'm in so much pain. Right? So I'm like, all right, God, help me get on this boat. I get on the boat, fall in. I'm like, yeah, we just go home. I'm done. We're out of here. We need to leave. I'm in a lot of pain. We end up going and staying the, the night at uh, my brother-in-law's family's house. We stay there. And then we go. I go to the doctors the next morning. And he sent me, they sh- uh, sent me out to some uh, orthopedic. And he looked at it. He looked at my knee, he's like, yeah, you tore your MCL, but it's not a major tear. It wasn't a full tear, so you won't need surgery, but you're going to have to stay in this brace for like months and months and months until it heals up. And he's like, you must be in a lot of pain, so I'm going to put you in an order for a prescription for some pain pills. I'm like, yeah, I don't want that. Because in my head, I'm like, man, if I have that prescription of pain pills, it's going to bring back a lot of these chemical dependencies I had before, and I don't want to entertain that at all in any way, shape, or form, because if I take some of those pain pills, it may make me want to start doing other things that I used to hold as an idol before God and worship that instead of worshiping God. So I was like, no thanks, I don't need any pain pills. He's like, all right. So of course he thought I was just saying that because I didn't want to have to pay for it. So he went and got me a bunch of samples, put it in a, like a huge bag, it's like a trash bag, gave it to me. He was like, here you go, you don't have to worry about buying anything. I was like, that's not what I was worried about. So I go home, give all the pills to my wife, and I lived off of Motrin, right, for a little while to help me kill the pain because that's what the Navy tells you will kill all ills. 800 milligrams of Motrin will fix pretty much anything. So I used Motrin to fix all the pain in my knee. But there was a reason I didn't entertain the offer for the pain pills because I knew my conscience wasn't ready. My conscience was weak, and I couldn't handle the temptation to take those pills and yet still be true to God. So I made sure that I didn't take it and I had no part of that. That was what was going on for these people here in Corinth. And the same thing that goes on in our lives with other believers. Even though we may be free to do some things, we shouldn't because it can cause others to fall into sin. So as a Christian, we have all freedom. But because of that freedom in Christ, here's the kicker. We have the freedom to give it up for out of love for our brothers and sisters. We have that freedom to give it up. We are called to love one another just like Christ. It says, no greater love than this than the one who gives up his life for his friends. So are you all willing to give up your life? Are you willing to give up your rights? Are you willing to give up your freedoms that you have in Christ for your friends who may be struggling with certain situations? Because that's where true freedom is found. That's where true love is found. That's where it all comes together in Christ. Guys, we should be willing to give up anything that may cause a brother or sister to stumble. Because we're looking at their life more important than ours. We're willing to sacrifice our life for their life. Because that's exactly what Christ did for us. And that's what Paul says here. He says, I will stop eating meat if it causes any of my brothers or sisters to stumble. I'm going to give it up completely. 
So what are some things we should be willing to give up around people so we don't tempt them to sin? What about your friend who's grew up in a really abusive house because his dad would come home drunk and he would beat his mom. He'd come in well on the kids a little bit and he has this idea that maybe if he drinks any alcohol at all, he'll turn into that same man. So he has once no part of it and he doesn't want to be around it. Are you willing to sacrifice your rights to have a drink, not to get drunk, because that's against the Bible, right? To have a drink. Are you willing to give up your rights to have a drink around that person because of all the things that come with that for them? What about movies? I have some friends who I know only watch PG movies because they're afraid of watching anything above PG because there's some things in there that may make their thought go to places they don't want their mind to go. So they put up borders for themselves because they know if they look at certain things, it'll draw them into temptation and sin. So they put up barriers and walls to help protect them. Are you willing to let that Marvel's movie go around your friend so you can help build them up in their Christian walk? What about music? So when I was doing a lot of drugs right back in the day, this is a lot of time my wife and I, we would go out to these parties, and there was lots of music involved. And so for my wife, this same music still holds a lot of trauma for her. She can't really listen to it and actually hold a good conscience because it brings up all this past things that we used to do. And for her, it hurts her. It damages her. So why wouldn't I, out of my love for her and as a brother in Christ, why wouldn't I not give up my right to listen to that kind of music around her so she's not harmed or hurt in any way, shape, or form because of all the emotions and trauma it brings back up? What about politics? If we know somebody who's struggled with politics and trying to distance themselves a little bit and all we want to do is talk about politics and we know for a fact that they're trying not to because it puts them in a bad place because all they do is get overwhelmed in politics and they can't think about God because they're thinking about what the idiot did up at the White House. Right? Are we willing to let that go? Are we willing to talk about something else? Are we willing to give God more glory instead of trying to get off our chest, the things that are aggravating us? Or how about how we dress? I work in a gym, and I am in no way condoning that men who wear their thongs out at the beach, please stop doing that. No one's being tempted to sin because of you. But please for the love of God, nobody wants that and branded on their brain. I'm still trying to get a lot of images out of my brain that I never want to see again. And there are no way tempting other women, I don't think. God help you if you are, right? Please stop wearing that. So that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is how we dress. If we know, ladies, that there's men who have struggled with pornography and they have this lust that's innate in them, why wouldn't we go out of our way to dress in a way that helps to honor them and their struggles and their lust? Right? I had a few ladies who I've talked to at my gym about this who are Christians. I'm like, hey, what you're wearing may not be appropriate for some of these guys. And we're trying to you know, keep this a Christian brand that's safe for everybody to come to. And I know it's not up to you to keep them from sinning. Right? But that's still on them. But we don't want to create a doorway that's going to potentially allow them to start lusting, to start doing things they don't want to do. Right? Because sometimes that grips a hold of you and you're like, what am I doing? And in no way am I being legalistic about this. I'm not saying that, hey, you all should start dressing in dresses and you should come in here, veil your faces up. Right? I'm not meaning that in any way, shape, or form. I'm talking about the love that you have for somebody because you're exposing things that probably we shouldn't see. So how we dress, what are you guys doing that is actually harming a brother or sister in Christ that you actually have influence over and that may be causing them to stumble, maybe pulling them into a sin arena that they shouldn't be entertaining whatsoever? It is better to show someone you love them in Christ by doing everything in your freedom to help keep them from sinning. In John 3, or 13, Jesus comes and he washes the disciples' feet, right? He washes their feet, and John's like, dude, you are not washing my feet. You are my master. 
I will have no part in this. He's like, if you don't, you will have no part in me. He's like, well, let's do it. And put my speedo on, right? You can scrub me down. But Jesus came. He brought himself lower than everything. He was sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He was here. And he brought himself on earth and poured himself out. It says in Philippians, he came, humbled himself before all men, poured himself out as a sacrifice for us so that we could be brought back into union with God so that he could be glorified. He made himself nothing when he was everything. He brought himself lower than everything so he could be brought up and glorified. And Jesus says, no servant is greater than his master. And if Jesus served and he sacrificed his entire life on earth and he became a servant to all and he poured himself out as a sacrifice, we should expect no different with our lives. If Christ did it, if he gave up everything, even though he didn't need to, if he gave it all up, shouldn't we be willing to do the very same things? So how can we make this happen? How can we make sure that we're doing everything in our power to help other people to stumble? Well, I got some practical applications for us that we can use here. But in no way, shape, or form is this practical application to be used as a guidebook to keep you holy. It's impossible. These can't do that. These are just for you to tune your heart to make sure you're staying in tune to God so that way he can pour his heart into your heart and actually you can be transformed. Because if you just try to keep these rules, you're never going to be transformed and you're just trying to do work out of your own flesh. And it's impossible and only God can do that work. So do not take these practical applications as something that you can take and use and that be it without appointing you into worship and to God our Savior who alone can do the change in your heart. So first we have, make sure that you're not blatantly in sin in the first place. Make sure you're not in blatant sin. So how do we do that? How do we know for in blatant sin? This is a great place to start. Open up the scriptures and start digging. See if there's anything in there that you are actually walking in blatant sin in that you need to remedy first and foremost. And you've got to do some study, and you're going to need to seek some wise counsel, and some things are going to be a little uh, gray areas because it's not exactly black and white because what about tattoos? It definitely talks about tattoos in there, right? Leviticus 19, I'm pretty sure it says something in there about that. So what do we do with that? There it says, do not mark your body for the dead because you're doing this as into idols and you're marking your body with pagan symbols to them because you think it's going to do something for the dead. So my take on this is probably don't put a pentagram on your face or do anything really weird like that because that's a pagan symbol. I wouldn't do that. And if you're also doing it because you think you're going to get your identity out of this and people are going to look at you a different way and they're going to put you and idolize you because you have certain things on you, then maybe you shouldn't do it either because your heart is definitely not in the right place. And it'll probably be sin as well. Second, this is very important. We need to be truthful with ourselves and make sure that we are not in direct opposition to our own conscience. You guys have to make sure and you have to just search your heart. It's going to take a lot of prayer. It's going to take a lot of uh, introspect into yourself. And it's also going to probably take some outside help to see if anything was going to open the door for you for sin. What is your heart behind those decisions? Are you allowing yourself to be tempted just like the pain pills for me? Am I opening the door for other things to come in and actually have their way in my life? And then the third thing we can ask ourselves, by making this decision, could it hinder anybody's walk with Christ? Is it going to hinder their relationship at all with God? One way you can look at this is, does it break your heart when you see another person in Christ being broken by sin? seeing them struggle day after day, being tempted in the same temptations over and over, does that break your heart? Because if it doesn't, you need to go to God right now and you need to ask for more of his heart in your heart and for you to be able to see the things that he sees because it breaks his heart. Because he prayed a, paid a beautiful price for that not to happen on the cross. And it breaks his heart to see it happen and to see one of his children struggling. 
So if it does not break your heart, you need more of God's heart within yours. And because of that, will you be able, will you do everything in your power to keep it from happening? Are you going to do everything in your power if you know somebody struggles with sin? Are you going to do everything in your power to keep that from happening on your watch? So as we finish here, the main thing Jesus is concerned about is always our heart. What is our heart behind anything? What is our heart? What are our intentions? Is it to build us up? Is it to build up the self? Is it to build up our idols or is it to glorify him? Because if it's it's not to glorify him, then it's the wrong thing. And it's not founded in love. Just like Jesus told the rich young ruler, he said to give up all your riches. He said to give up them all and follow me. Because he knew that his riches were standing between him and a relationship with Christ the Almighty. Notice he didn't say the very same thing to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had all this money. He was a tax collector. Consumed tons of wealth. But he didn't tell Zacchaeus the very same thing. He doesn't say, go give up all your riches. Because why? Riches were not an issue for Zacchaeus. It didn't grip his heart. It wasn't an idol for Zacchaeus. But it was for this rich young ruler. So are we willing to give up our idols? What is our heart? Do, are we willing to give it up? Are we willing to give up our freedom for others? Because, y'all, we are called to take up our cross every single day, die to ourselves, and not to please ourselves. God doesn't want us to go out there and make ourselves look better. He wants us to go lay it all on the line, sacrifice ourselves for others, so he can be glorified above all else. Because true Christian love is the only foundation to truly enjoy true Christian freedom. Only when we have the ability to say no do we really get to enjoy the freedom that we actually have. And this is only found by knowing God and being known by God. And this happens through relationship. This doesn't happen overnight. It happens through relationship and being exposed to his heart continually. If you think about children, parents do things and they set up areas for their children so that they can have the best life. And they put restrictions on their children so because of out of their love, they don't want to see them suffer. And as the children get older and they look back and they start to go through certain things, they look and they're like, wow, my father, my mother, they were actually doing those things out of their love for me. And it starts to create this bond and relationship that wasn't there before because they're truly understanding their parents for the first time. This is the same thing with God. If we don't have that relationship and we can't look back on all the things that he's been doing in our life, we're never going to really know God. It's just us trying to keep rules in this book, and that's never going to change our heart. It's never going to change our relationship with others, and it's never going to allow ourselves to die to ourselves and put others above us. So we're going to pray. We're going to get ready to take communion here.